ANA eLearning Academy is brought to you by CDN Graysheet, a trusted source of rare coin and currency valuations since 1963. So everyone, welcome. Thank you for joining us today for the ANA eLearning Academy. The ANA would like to thank our eLearning partner, Graysheet, for the support of the eLearning program. Today we've got Hans Liu, who will be presenting on um, <clears throat> lecturing on coins and currency on cruise ship approaches and lessons learned. So you're going to be muted for this presentation. If you have any que questions, you can put them in the Q&A or chat box, and uh, I'll go ahead and read them to Hans at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, let's go ahead and hand over the floor to you, Hans. Okay, thanks very much, and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I'm going to try to speak for 45 minutes, and I'll show you summaries of three presentations I've given in the past six or seven years uh, on cruises, uh, both in Northern Europe and the Mediterranean and the Danube. And um, oops. as an overview, uh, when I was asked to choose a topic for this uh, session, uh, I thought about something I'd been kicking around for a while and it actually started doing, which was combining hobbies, uh, combining hobbies of uh, coin collecting, also photography uh, with the vocation, which was giving lectures. And I have to give you my background. Uh, I'm a physician. Uh, I've given a lot of lectures, probably over 500 uh, in almost all of the 50 states and about 19 foreign countries. And generally I'm speaking about antibiotics or infections or pneumonia or, or vaccines. Uh, and so I've done a lot of those and uh, I got the idea that perhaps I could do uh, something similar with uh, coins and currency. Now, uh, I have to admit that when you give an educational lecture to a group of professionals or a group of students, uh, you're trying to convey information. Uh, and you want everybody to take something away from it, and, and that's difficult. Uh, but you try to uh, make certain points, repeat them, uh, be entertaining. And I think when you think about uh, cruise ship lecturing or talking about a hobby, you want to emphasize the entertaining part. And you also want to um, generate a good audience. So one trick is to uh, emphasize a title that people would come and want to hear. After all, if you go on a cruise, you're probably going to want to enjoy yourself and, and maybe learn a little something at the same time. Now, it turns out there's a formal way of uh, approaching cruise ship entertainment departments. They're the ones who are run by the cruise director and, and handle uh, entertainment as opposed to say services or excursions or housekeeping. Uh, and generally you would email them, send a, a resume of some sort, and most of them ask for a, a video. Um, I didn't do any of that uh, in part because I wasn't auditioning to be a, a magician or a juggler or a dancer. And so I just sent a simple uh, three paragraph email saying I'm someone who's lectured. I have a fair amount of experience in coins. Uh, I'm willing to give a talk for you, and I would emphasize at no cost to the uh, the business, uh, which I think is a big, big attraction for them. So if you had visions of going on a free cruise or, or being comped, I'm sure it happens for some big names, for some really well-known entertainers. But, you know, this is something that's done more uh, for fun and entertainment. Now, uh, most uh, things are done uh, by PowerPoint. Now, obviously, if you're a magician or a dancer, it'd be a performance. But I think when you're showing something like coins, it's possible to try to do a small group session, passing around things. But more likely, you're going to be put in an auditorium with a group of varying size. And so you're going to do a PowerPoint. However, for my presentations, I did incorporate a, a, function, a feature of show and tell. I brought some coins so people could actually handle them. Uh, they could see the weight and, and how they gleamed and, and look at the artistry and, and in some cases with currency, uh, handle the currency and, and uh, get an idea of what, what it was like actually using them. Uh, another thing I did kind of on the spur of the moment uh, was to arrange for door prizes. And uh, I have mixed feelings about that. I think that this stems from Field of Dreams, where they said, if you build it, they will come. In medical lecturing, uh, the, the tenant is, uh, if you feed them, 
they will come to a noon conference. And so for a entertainment lecture on a cruise ship, I opted to uh, bring a couple of door prizes. And I always asked the cruise line uh, if this was permitted because I didn't want the, to run across any rules against giveaways or contests or things like that. Now, I did find uh, that in keeping with scientific lectures, uh, I would do um, due diligence. Uh, I would uh, try to make sure that some stories I thought I knew well were accurate. Uh, my one nightmare was always having a world's expert in, uh, you know, uh, ancient coins or, or modern uh, European coinage uh, sitting in on the lecture and, and for me to say something that, that I couldn't back up. So I did a fair amount of research, even on topics that I thought I knew pretty well. You also run into some considerations about legal issues, such as copyright. Uh, often it's okay to use things that are posted on the net. Uh, however, if, for example, um, if there's something that's copyrighted, uh, then you have different rules. For example, if there's a magazine cover uh, that shows some uh, inflationary event or, or new coin striking, uh, I think you're allowed to use it as a one-time only if you identify the magazine. Uh, I think on the other hand, if you're creating a webinar that you're gonna monetize, or you're gonna create something that you circulate for, for uh, remuneration, well, then the rules are different and you, you probably should seek permission. Uh, in addition now, as many of you know, uh, when you're importing coins or bringing coins across borders, there's concern that you're, you're uh, looting the uh, cultural heritage of a country. This has come up obviously with uh, ancient artifacts, but some people are, are trying to extend that to coins. So I've, I've become very careful. I'm fine with bringing a US silver dollar. Uh, I'm much more careful if I'm bringing an, an ancient Greek drachma, for example. And along the way, I'll tell you a couple of approaches that I've, I've used uh, to kind of keep from straying into any kind of import export uh, situations. There's technical stuff. Uh, you have to bring the right cables. A lot of times it's just a flash drive now, but I always check with the cruise lines. Uh, the venues can be funny. Uh, I'm used to lecturing in amphitheaters or, or classrooms and aboard a ship, there, things are in constant motion. And so the very first lecture I gave back in 2015, uh, I was hoping for a couple of dozen people I got a couple of dozen people and they gave me a 900 person amphitheater. So I said, well, can we switch to something else? And they said, everything else is in use. You know, this is what you've got. So we, we gave the talk in a 900 seat amphitheater. Language is usually English. Uh, however, some of what we do with coinage or other things are, are universal, showing pictures, pointing out features. And of course there's a learning curve, which I think you'll get a a sense of as I go through the, uh, the slides I've used. Now, the first cruise was a uh, Baltic cruise. It started off in uh, Berlin, as some cruises stop in Gdansk, Poland, through the Baltic Republics, up to Tallinn and Estonia, St. Petersburg, which of course has the wonderful Hermitage Museum, Helsinki, Finland, uh, Stockholm, Sweden, and then back to Copenhagen. Uh, as you can see, I titled that one, Coins and Currency, Art, History, and Finance Over the Millennia, trying to cover a lot of topics. I knew a lot of people on the cruise were interested in art and history, and I guess everyone is interested to a degree about finance, and so I made that the theme of the talk. You'll see that I picked kind of a white background. Uh, one of the tricks is if you're not sure of the lighting where you're going to be, if it's not going to be a darkened classroom, you may not go you may not want to go with a dark background uh, slide because it's harder to see the text. It's easier to see black on white. Um, this is a uh, Lydian um, Electrum coin from about uh, 550 or 600 BC. Uh, and I just used to show an example of some of the first uh, coinage. Another example, and again, I was drawing from things not necessarily from my collection because a lot of the coins you'll see are quite pricey, uh, but things giving people a sense of the flow of coinage and, and how art and history and, and technology uh, combine. This is another uh, Lydian stator. It shows the, uh, the lion and the bull. And one of the things that I emphasize is how small this is. This is about a half an inch in its greatest dimension. And so it really speaks to the artistry of the person who was able to, to engrave that. 
Uh, I moved on to uh, ancient Greece. This is, of course, an Athenian tetradrachm. It has Athena, the goddess, patron goddess of Athens, the owl signifying wisdom, the olive, uh, which is extremely important to Greece even today, and then the letters A, Alpha, Theta, Epsilon, standing uh, for uh, Athens. Uh, and this one, uh, it turns out when you see some of these uh, lines and such, uh, I worked very hard to eliminate them when I imported my old talk into this talk, some of them resurfaced. So there are always these unexpected things. This was also in much sharper focus originally, but it's a Syracusan decadracum, a large coin. It shows the artistry uh, with uh, someone able to show four horses in perspective. Uh, and in fact, this is one of the first sign pieces of coinage by uh, Kimon, who uh, made sure everybody knew who he was and what he did because he signed it three in three different places. Uh, this is a, a famous coin in Alexander Tetradrachum. Uh, this is important because it shows the face of Alexander III or Alexander the Great uh, and probably was adapted from a lifetime portrait or in some cases an early postmortem uh, depiction. It shows him wearing the lion skin of Hercules, also Zeus on the back. And one of the things that I think audiences like to see is pointing out that even uh, nowadays we can still read the ancient Greek inscriptions. This is Alpha uh, lambda, epsilon, so forth, uh, indicating Alexander. And then we move on to um, Rome. This is uh, something that was struck after the assassination of Julius Caesar. Uh, it shows uh, a portrait of Caesar, who was imperator. The uh, daggers used on the Ides of March, which is the middle of March when he was assassinated, uh, and a liberty cap symbolizing that uh, this um, was a strike against freedom. This is obviously propaganda uh, on behalf of, um, of Julius Caesar. This goes uh, into the uh, subsequent struggles. This is Cleopatra. You can see her name on one side of this uh, Greek um, Ptolemaic coin. This is uh, Mark Antony, who always looked like a pretty tough customer. He looks like a boxer who's gone a couple of rounds in the ring, and you can also see Antony depicted. And I think it gives people a sense of uh, again, like the Alexander the Great uh, Tetradrachum, showing personalities from history and showing that we have a, a clear tie to them through coinage. Uh, then we move on to Augustus. Uh, I won't say much about this, except that this is a, a very handsome, youthful looking Augustus, which is pretty good because at the time this was minted, he was pushing 60 years old. And it just shows <laughs> that as a, a Roman emperor, he had absolute control over his images. And I think one of the few people to have that much control over uh, media depictions is uh, Lucille Ball uh, of I Love Lucy. And then I, I jump to the Middle Ages. This is a uh, Joachim Thaler. Uh, many of you know that in the uh, uh, 1500s, uh, a strike of silver was made in Joachimsthal, which is now in, in the Czech Republic. Uh, and instead of making small coins, the, the nickel-sized coins, before they went to much larger coins, uh, similar in size to our silver dollar. And these were known as uh, the town was Joachimsthal, which is the Valley of Joachim. This was, they were called Joachim's Thalers, then Taylors, the Dutch appropriated, called it Dalders. And then when it made it over to the New World, they were dollars. And this is what was adopted by the United States. This shows uh, the, one of the most prolific issues of uh, these uh, crown coins or dollar, dollar sized coins. This is a pillar dollar uh, of Spain. And Spain, of course, had access to large amounts of silver from its mines in the New World. And you have the, the globe, you have the pillars of Hercules, which symbolizes the entrance to the Medi from the Atlantic to the Mediterranean Sea, which Spain controlled. And of course, you have the, <clears throat> um, uh, the coat of arms of the ruling family of Spain. On the pillars, on ribbons, are originally uh, ni plus ultra, which means there's nothing more here, uh, which meant that this was the end of the world. There's no need to go beyond this and we control it, which is kind of Spain's claim to, to control of the Mediterranean and the seas. Uh, 
I move on to show that this was the change from corporate Spain to that of the individual ruler. They decided to put their um, portraits on the coins. Uh, and of course, they maintained again, the, the pillars uh, and, the, and the motto. Now, uh, my, one of my interests is British Commonwealth and 19th century British crowns. And this was one uh, that later, uh, it shows that the British government, which was um, had a shortage of silver, uh, appropriated Spanish coins. And ultimately in 1804, they counterstamped them uh, entirely. But their first uh, try was uh, before that, when they put the head of King George III, either in an oval or an octagon on the, the neck of uh, King Charles IV of Spain. And the Brits never won to let an opportunity to, to mock someone go by, uh, came up with a jingle that went something like, uh, poor King George to make his money pass, stamp the head of the fool on the neck of an ass. Mm -hmm. And again, it's always fun to show gold. This was a, a Scudo coin. Uh, again, this brings up ideas of pirate treasure and, and so forth. Now, one thing I did is I told you I incorporated show and tell, and it's more difficult than say in a classroom or a coin club, uh, you have these things circulating around, you don't have it, you know who has it, how do you refer to it, how do you know it doesn't walk out the door, and I wound up taking a poster board, uh, polyethylene, polyphthalate, uh, envelopes, uh, mounting coins. And so these, these are pretty big, uh, but they allow you to handle them. And this is a, a Spanish dollar, Spanish eight reels piece. This one happens to show a lot of countermarks. And I point out to audiences that, listen, some people feel this spoils the coin, uh, to, you know, damaging the <laughs> surface. Other people say this is, this is historic. This is evidence that these coins circulated. They were in uh, the Orient, they were used in trade, and yet they've made it back for us to, to handle. This is, uh, now, what I did with regard to very expensive coins, and I point out, that I do have this one now, I did not have it then, uh, but this is a, a reproduction. This is a replica. It is stamped copy. It's gold-plated silver, I think, uh, and, and probably about $30 uh, on, on the market now. Uh, but I, I mounted it like this to show the relative size so people handling it would realize they weren't looking at a big, large coin on the screen. They're, they were looking at a, a magnification. Uh, these are, again, some reproductions of um, Roman denarii, and I was able to put several uh, on one page. Uh, and in one of the talks, I included um, paper money. Now, these are military, military payment certificates from the U.S. military, and you can either mount it to show front and back, or if you're doing a lot of them, you can mount them to, to flip up. So this allows you to uh, send, circulate this in the audience. If somebody raises their hand and says, what is this, and they show you the blue uh, cardboard, well, you, you can kind of answer their, their questions. Now, I did uh, come up with two door prizes on the Baltic cruise. The first one is a Spanish dollar. Now, many of you know the story of El Cazador, which was a treasure ship, uh, which was sent from Veracruz, Mexico to New Orleans uh, in the um, 1780s, and it never made it. It sank with 450,000, which is 17 tons of Spanish silver on board. Um, this led to drastic consequences because the King of Spain was going to use it to pay all of his administrators and soldiers in New Orleans who were controlling the, the Louisiana territory. And without that, he eventually relinquished that to the French king, who was his cousin. Uh, and the French king uh, actually gave way to Napoleon, who sold it to the U.S. to raise money to make war in Britain. So theoretically, it's possible that if the El Cazador had not sunk on its way to New Orleans, uh, that Spain would have held on to that territory. The U.S. would now end at the Mississippi River, and on the southern border, we would be faced with either a Spanish Texas or an independent country uh, of Texas. So it makes for a very interesting uh, piece. These are fairly common. The piece I gave out was not even in this good condition. It, it, you could see the 
the rough features on this on one side, but the, the other side was in, in excellent condition. And you can explain to the audience that this shows a lot of these coins were on the ocean floor, they were covered by another coin, or one side was down in the sand, the other side was facing up and corroded by salt water. So it's a historical piece. And we gave this one out to the youngest att uh, um, attendee of the conference. I think it was probably a young teen or a nine or 10 year old and, and they were pretty happy with it. The other thing I gave out was a hundred, $100 trillion Zimbabwe bill. I think this is the highest denominated dollar note that's been issued uh, way back when, this was 2008 when it was issued. Uh, I bought uh, probably about 10 or so and there were three or $4 a piece as I recall. Uh, and since then, they've kept going up, which has amazed me. I think I saw them for a time at $100, $150. I saw an ad today. I just checked on, on eBay, and they were asking $350, which is rather ridiculous. But they, they tend to fluctuate in the $100, $120 range. So this was given to the oldest uh, attendee uh, to that particular talk. Now, the next cruise is from the Southern Mediterranean. And I have plus minus on the screen because we really didn't make the southern part of the Mediterranean. We, we chose to uh, cruise in March. Uh, we were supposed to go from Rome to uh, Trapani, Sicily, and then there were 50 knot winds. So they tried to put it in Naples, couldn't make it into Naples, did eventually make Trapani, could not land in Tunisia. Uh, they, they, it wasn't really the weather. I think they were having an immigration crisis and worried about people trying to, to board the ship uh, in port. We made it to Cagliari, uh, Sardinia. Uh, and then in trying to get to Algiers, the weather was again atrocious. We wound up in Mallorca, finally visited Valencia, which is lovely, and wound up in Barcelona. Uh, you can see I've changed to a black background. This was on a uh, 2018, uh, a newer cruise ship, which had kind of state-of-the-art um, uh, rooms. And they gave me what was really the nightclub, but with a large screen uh, back projection, or no, I'm sorry, LED TV and a mic, and, and it was just absolutely lovely. And I chose to start uh, with ancient coins again, but we, we, we kind of focused on uh, Hannibal and the uh, Punic Wars. So this is a war elephant from the uh, 200 to 80 BC. This shows you, and remember, this cruise was in the Southern Mediterranean. Uh, so we were going in theory to, to uh, dock in Tunis, which is near the site of Carthage, as well as visit uh, places along the um, uh, Sicily and, and, and Spain. Uh, and this just shows that uh, in the uh, 260s, the Punic Wars were a series of wars that went on over 100 years. This one involved Hannibal, who was the greatest general Carthage had, and he marched over the Alps from Spain with war elephants and carried on war in Italy uh, for years. And so uh, Carthage was a Greek colony, was a sea power, uh, Rome was a land power, and the two struggled for years until Carthage was eventually completely destroyed. This is a Carthaginian shekel from about 200 BC. It shows Hannibal, uh, and it shows a war elephant. Um, we, I was hoping this would be a nice lead-in to our docking uh, in Tunis, which didn't happen, but this was a recent Tunisian banknote, again showing Hannibal, but in this case a a, uh, a uh, Carthaginian oared warship. Now, this is something I have brought up before. I tend to like the Joachim's Taylor uh, because it's a big silver coin. I, I like big silver coins. This goes back now uh, 500 years. And I show uh, a um, Spanish treasure ship uh, which sunk and, and those artifacts are frequently available. And we go into a discussion of the Spanish cob, which originally was a relatively irregular coin uh, cut from a bar of silver and really for the convenience of shipping coins back from the new world to Spain and giving the king his fifth, his 20% share for allowing the, the expeditions. Now, I think I pointed out that the motto of Spain in those days was knee plus ultra, nothing beyond here. Uh, 
obviously after 1492 that had to be modified. And this was probably the greatest rebranding in history, uh, greater than even uh, Old Coke and, and New Coke. Uh, but the Spanish said, well, now that we've got something beyond the Pillars of Hercules that we own, the, the, the Spanish colonies in the New World, they changed their motto to plus ultra. There is more. And the implication is it's ours. We have it. And again, this just shows you the pillar dollar with plus ultra spelled out. And I point out that uh, when there wasn't small change, the large Spanish dollar was cut into bits. This is uh, one bit, a quarter is two bits, uh, half is four bits. And some people who are old enough to remember silver coins also remember the, the jingle um, shave and a haircut two bits. And the, the Spanish dollar was in fact legal currency in the United States till about 1857. Now, and this again is gold. I, I put this in to show you how gold shows up so nicely uh, against a background. And again, for this particular talk, because we were going to dock in Spain, we talked about treasure ships and um, pieces of eight, which are the silver coins, and gold doubloons, which were the two escudo coins. Uh, and this shows again back to the portrait dollar. Uh, in those days, communications was slow. And it took months to get a vessel from the Mediterranean to the New World. And so when a monarch died in Spain, the news didn't instantaneously propagate to all the, the mints. And it would be months, sometimes a year or two, before they realized they had a new monarch. Uh, they often had no idea what the new monarch looked until another vessel came with a portrait or an engraving of the, the monarch. And so what some mints did with the changeover is they kept using the old monarchs uh, bust, but they might change the, the, um, the legend around the coin. Uh, other mint masters went entirely, you know, imaginary and had leg imaginary busts. Well, we don't know what he looks like, but we'll make them look good. And, and so, so they'll be happy. So now you get into a story that in Lisbon, uh, there's a statue of Pedro IV, uh, the king of uh, Portugal at that time, which is down at the water, it's up on a 30 foot pedestal. And as the story goes, uh, in Mexico, Maximilian was emperor in the 1760s. And he commissioned a, a bronze statue to glorify his reign. And he had it made in somewhere like Italy where the craftsmen were. And as it was being shipped uh, through the Mediterranean to Lisbon to, to for its final long voyage to Mexico, he was overthrown. And more than that, he was executed. So there wasn't any chance of him making a comeback. So the, the urban legend is that the captain of the ship pulled into Lisbon, realized he had a statue, he wasn't gonna be able to deliver or get money from anybody in Mexico. And he said, hey, anybody want an unused statue of a ruler? And the Portuguese said, sold. Uh, you can go and look at this, and it turns out, like other urban legends, when I looked into it, it's probably not true. Uh, it, when they examine the statue in detail, some of the buttons and the medals have uh, appropriate Portuguese uh, symbols in the cast bronze. So it, it, it's a nice story, but it's probably not true. But the, the imaginary bust uh, Spanish dollars do exist. Now, we, we go on and, and probe a little bit more. I talked about the Joachimsthal kind of mutating uh, to dollar, and this shows the original coin and, for comparison, a U.S. silver dollar. Where did the dollar sign come from? I had always uh, kind of uh, bought the explanation that it was from the ribbons curling around the pillars of Hercules, which kind of looked like an S, and maybe if you really imagine maybe a U.S. or a uh, dollar sign. Uh, and this was maintained for many, many uh, generations. Uh, but it, it turns out that that, as you'll see in my third lecture, is, is an oversimplification and probably not true. Now, another story which makes sense to give in the Mediterranean, because most of the countries uh, use the euro, is that when the European Union was formed, it was a monetary organization. And they chose seven denominations, which, as you'll see, differ in size and color, making it easier to understand than American currency. And they chose an entranceway on the front side 
and a bridge on the backside. But that's where political correctness kind of intervened. And the powers to be said, well, you know, we, we have seven bills, but we have more than seven countries. And if a country doesn't get its bridge on the bill, maybe they'll be upset and maybe they want to, their picture to be bigger. So what they did was they said, okay, make imaginary bridges. So none of these bridges exist. They're all in someone's imagination. Huh. Now, the, the Dutch are very um, practical people. They also have kind of a wry sense of humor when you dig down. And so they said, okay, well, we're going to build the bridges. So in one of their parks in Holland, they built every single bridge, not, not in full size. These are pedestrian bridges, but as you can see, they, they mirror what's there. So this is a case of art imitating life, imitating art or, or something like that. And I think if you're European, you, you kind of get a, a kick out of, of seeing that, uh, even though we weren't anywhere near Holland at the time. That's awesome. Now, it turns out my last cruise was about six months ago. We did the Eastern Danube, and it turns out most Danube cruises start somewhere out here in Nuremberg and end in Vienna or Bratislava or often Budapest. And this one started in Vienna and cruises all the way through Croatia, Serbia, between Romania and Bulgaria, and ends at the Black Sea. So this is the, it's about 1,200 miles altogether. And it's a lovely, lovely cruise, uh, though in the age of COVID, it, it was somewhat challenging. We title it Coins of Central and Eastern Europe, Art and History Over Three Millennia. Uh, showed that uh, here are the Persian Empire, the Turks, the Greeks, the Romans, and of course up here is the Danube. And so a number of the tribes, including the Greeks, the Macedonians, uh, the Dacians and the Scythians, uh, all were in some of the countries that we, we passed through in addition to showing where Spain, the, the Straits of Gibraltar, the Pillars of Hercules were and, and so forth. And I started a little bit earlier. This is an Ionian stater from 650 BC. They, probably started picking up river pebbles, which were electrum, a mixture of naturally occurring mixture of gold and silver. Uh, and you can see the punch marks in the reverse. And some people say these are waves. I, I think they're probably just scratches, but they showed that this was man-made, this, this was a coin. Uh, this is the, the same one, but I've added some things about uh, the, the date, and I remember this particular cruise line, when I first showed this, insisted the dates be proper, BCE, so we went with BCE. Uh, I didn't show the one with the king. Uh, this was uh, minted around the time of Croesus, Croesus, who was king and controlled this gold, and he was probably the model for King Midas. He, he had so much wealth, they still use the term as riches, uh, Croesus. Again, the Alexander Tetradrachum. But now I learned that uh, you need to put things in perspective. So for a European audience, I showed it next to a two euro coin so people would get a feel for, for the size. Of course, the, the Tetradrachum is much thicker. <clears throat> this shows some Greek art and a little bit of Greek humor. And then I, I moved and instead of showing tetradrachms, which are large, impressive, but less common than the drachm coin, which this is a Greek drachm, again, with a not so good impression of Alexander the Great, uh, the size of a 10 euro cent piece. This was a Caesar with the elephant, uh, again, kind of an, uh, um, alluding to the Punic Wars, the, the size of a, of a US cent. And I went on to show the extent of the Roman Empire. Uh, again, this was Augustus Caesar. Uh, and then the fact that this was for the Brits on the cruise, that the pound shilling pence system, which just went way out of uh, use uh, years ago, was from the Roman Libra Solidus Denarius. And again, you, you show another one with another um, uh, current uh, Euro coin. And this showed that after that, after those coins, a similar model was used for centuries. This is from hundreds, many, well, about a millennia ago, showing the Madonna and Child. This is one of my favorites from the 1200s. It's a uh, denier of Richard the Lionhearted, 
who didn't uh, mint any coins with his uh, uh, name in Britain. He spent all of his time off at the Crusades, but this is one from one of his uh, French holdings uh, and shows uh, Ricardus or Richard, and then the name of the, uh, the kingdom. Uh, and then I, I thought about it and finally had to incorporate a mention of Transylvania because we were going through uh, actually the southern border of Romania and, and Vlad Dracula's castles in the northern part of Romania. And it's a little bit disin disingenuous because uh, Dracula did not issue coins. His ancestors, immediate ancestors, did, however. So that's how we worked uh, Dracula, um, Vlad the Impaler uh, into the, the narrative. There are some modern coins, uh, an Irish, a large Irish silver uh, commemorative, but they're, they're all kind of a little bit commercial. And then finally, we wound up talking about the Holy Roman Empire, which kind of transitioned into Austria-Hungary. And we were, of course, trans moving through Vienna, Budapest, which was in Hungary, and then through other parts of what were contested between the Austro-Hungarians and the Ottomans. So that gave me again a chance to show the Joachim Thaler. But in this case, I brought two show and tell Joachim Thalers, not, not genuine. I'm not crazy enough to bring one of those on an overseas trip, but I, I bought two silver replicas and you can tell they're replicas because this one has a date of 1967. This one, which is really not as good, but again, 1994. So these were things I was able to, to pass out saying, this is an example of the first large silver coin that was in regular circulation as of 500 years ago. And then we dug a little bit deeper into the origin of the dollar sign. Uh, I had thought it was from the uh, ribbons around the pillar of Hercules. In addition, Charles IV had a very small half real coin, which had his monogram. And you can see this, the S, so the dot looks very much like a dollar sign. Uh, but apparently the, the current thinking is that generations of accountants in Spain had to write peso, P.S., and got tired of writing PS. So they kind of slurred it into one, one symbol over time. And so 5,000 accountants are probably the reason that PS became the, the dollar sign. And then finally, I because we were in the Danube region in Central Europe, I showed some of the crazier examples of large silver tailors. This is the wild man tailor. This is one depicting the rulers. You have the, the three brothers, Taylor. This has four brothers, one on one side, three on the other. So you know who was first among equals. And the record I think is the eight brothers, Thaler, uh, from uh, one of the forerunners of Saxony. There were four, there were eight brothers, the child of the Duke, and all of them managed to get themselves onto the, the coin. And then everyone, or I think a lot of people know about uh, Leopold the Hogmouth. He was emperor of Austria-Hungary. Uh, he allowed his picture to be shown uh, really quite realistically. And he had a very protruding uh, lower jaw, which was apparently one of the characteristics of the, the Austro-Hungarian royalty, but it, it developed this rather unfortunate nickname. Uh, and this is a Hungarian forint with the, the Madonna and Child. And this is the um, Maria Teresa Taylor, uh, minted before 1780. 1780 has continued to be minted by mints around the world because it's a very effective trade dollar. Uh, apparently, even the counterfeit versions carry the full weight of silver because they're, they're so trusted in North Africa and other places. And, and the British sovereign has achieved sort of a similar position. Well, I showed uh, something that I eventually bought after many years of saving. This is a Ming dynasty a note from between the 14th and the 16th centuries. Uh, it actually is a thousand cash note showing 10 strings of 100 cash coins each. And on the back in red, uh, is a notice that said, attention forgers, uh, there's a death penalty if you forge this, and half of your estate will be given to the whistleblower. So they were pretty serious about uh, fighting counterfeiting. And this transitions to an article from the Numismatist just a few months ago, September, 
about the time I was on my cruise. So I, I managed to get this just before we went off and it shows the hyperinflation in Hungary. This shows that the money was worth so little it was dumped in the streets and the street sweepers were, were stuck with cleaning it up. This is from the numismatist article. It shows the notes kind of chronologically and that between November of 45 and July of 46, less than one year, the total value of circulating coin, uh, of notes in Pengo went from over 3 million US dollars to less than one US cent. So that's one of the reasons you, you really have to fear inflation. Uh, this shows one of the uh, largest denomination circulating banknotes. These are pretty affordable at about $50. This is a, um, a larger denomination note, which was never issued, but still is available to collectors. Uh, and this is again, the, the Zimbabwe note, which actually they went to hundred million, they revalued at a dollar, it went up again, they went down, it went up again. They switched to the dollar standard and now they're, they're kind of, they're trying to do e-currency the, the last I looked. And this just shows you in Venezuela where their uh, currency has had a similar hyperinflation. They, they kind of make paper sculptures out of the bills. This shows Nikola Tesla, who is a, a famous uh, scientist from Central Europe. He's in fact claimed by both the Croatians because I think he's Croatian by birth and the Serbians because he, he uh, practiced and did his experiments in Serbia. But this shows a coin touting his x-rays and, and so forth. And this just transitions into philately. This shows that the Taylor coin was has recently been, uh, I think around the 500th uh, anniversary uh, depicted on stamps of the Czech Republic. Uh, and finally, I, I close this uh, um, cruise with a number of gifts, uh, which I thought were pretty pretty good. Um, I got a little carried away. This was a um, graded uh, Maria Teresa uh, Taylor, a modern restrike, but really quite quite attractive. I paired one of the Hungarian notes with. Now, this is not a hundred million Taylor that was getting pretty pricey. Uh, as of last year, but a 50 trillion Taylor note. So that was one. Uh, we had a drawing or a lottery for it. <clears throat> uh, I finally broke down and bought one of these commercial sets, which are not terribly expensive. And they're, they're genuine coins. So again, technically not, not that of uh, Vlad from his reign. Uh, and the last one was a uh, Macedonian uh, a drachm, which was, again, I think decent condition, decent artistry, um, and, and again, um, graded because there are a lot of forgeries of these around now. So I think it made a, a, a pretty good um, uh, ending to that, that particular uh, conference. So I want to close with that. I'll just say three things and we'll open it up to questions. Uh, the, the first is that this is a, a way to combine uh, vocation of lecturing with interests in uh, coin collecting, currency collecting. And as you might have noticed when I started combining things like pictures of European coins for size comparisons or pictures of my own collection, I learned a lot about numismatic uh, photography. And number two, when you do the research to kind of make sure you're, you're staying pretty close to uh, the truth, you learn a great deal. And you learn that some of the things you, you heard weren't exactly uh, um, correct, but you can still say them. You just say it is alleged and it makes for a great story or urban legend. And the third thing I'll say and then open things up to questions is it, it can be a lot of fun. It, it's stressful to uh, talk in front of people, but when you're talking about something you like to do and you practice it, uh, it can be a tremendous amount of fun. So I say it doesn't have to be on a cruise ship. It can be to a, a coin club, it can be to a classroom, and, and hopefully some of the, the things that I did with handouts or, or stories using humor uh, will, will stand you in good stead. Thanks very much. Well, Hans, I just realized that I wasn't muted that whole time. You can obviously hear me right now. Yes, I can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. I wish I typically would mute myself. 
I don't have any questions um, in the QA right now or chat. Um, and one thing that I thought was really interesting was the uh, <coughs> the bits, how they would literally cut the coin into pieces. I had not seen that done before. And, and that's just an interesting thing to me to hand somebody a quarter of a coin and then to actually keep it as real value. They, they did the same thing, for example, in Europe and England. And you'll come across English cut uh, pennies, silver pennies which are ideally exactly a half. So sure. it's one approach to the, the uh, small chain shortage. Yeah, no doubt. Um, Ed was gonna ask, uh, did you just, or did you give just one lecture per cruise? I gave one lecture per cruise. Um, you, you learn to expect all kinds of crazy things. Uh, like I said, you, you're never quite sure what the venue is gonna be. Um, Sometimes you can be asked to do a uh, repeat. This is usually on an educational tour. Uh, but no, I, I, I've only done three cruises and I, I hope to kind of do more. But uh, okay. you know, those are those are some of the experiences I've had. Sure. Um, you know. um, Bill asked, did you get any compensation or discount for the cruise? No, I, I didn't. Uh, and what I made very clear in my messaging to the um, cruise lines is this is a freebie. You're not on the yeah. hook for anything. And I think that kind of made it easier for them to say, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll give this guy a try or we'll take him. And once you can say you've done it for a number of times, you know, I think they get the idea that, well, this is kind of value added for them. Sure. Sure. Uh, it turns out there is a market for uh, cruise lecturers and performers the lecturers tend to be experts in art and history, and they give uh, uh, in uh, talks that are port intensive. They say, well, we're going to visit uh, Valencia in Spain. Here's the history of Valencia. Here's some museums you'll see there. Those are, are very useful. And, and I think some of them are comped or get a discount. Uh, some people, I think, you know, I've seen cruises where Lech Walesa, the, the former president of Poland, or, or um, Gorbachev, the former president of the Soviet Union, have been featured maybe not on the cruise, but in one of the ports, they'll be a guest speaker. And obviously, they're being compensated probably quite a bit. Uh, but no, I, I, this is really a hobby. If I, if I lecture for medicine, uh, I do sometimes get sure. paid. Uh, so far, I haven't for uh, a coin talk. Okay. Unless, unless Ed was curious. Um, have you experienced a similar size? You had mentioned a couple dozen at one of your lectures. Is that pretty consistent in each one you're doing? Uh, it is. And, and I kind of like it that way. I mean, I think probably the one, the middle one, we probably had 50 or some people and the room was big enough. I couldn't see the back, uh, but you have to be ready to handle anything. But I, I really like the more intimate uh, groupings, because then you can call everybody down to the front. One of the one of the things you can do is you can you can um, show that silver coins ring very differently from sure. copper nickel, and so it's kind of like a show and tell demonstration. And I often will ask the cruise line to put a table in front, so that afterwards I can go down and, and talk with the the audience, and they can you know ask questions about specific coins and so forth. Sure. So for me, the, the ideal grouping size is probably about three dozen, but because you have a big screen and a microphone and God knows a 900 person amphitheater, it's possible they'll fill it up. But remember on the cruises, they're usually trying to fill up every spare moment. Uh, and usually a cruise, uh, a talk like something I do is gonna be scheduled in between like on a sea day uh, and people will be looking at either shopping, a show, sunbathing. And so you get a self-select group. These are people who are either interested in the art aspect or the, the uh, numismatic aspect. Uh, and so it works out pretty well. Um, I mean, the, the worst scenario is, you know, you give a party and nobody comes, but, but fortunately that <laughs> hasn't happened yet. <laughs> well, I have not seen anything else come through. Was there anything that you wanted to kind of finish up with? Um, you know, it's, or... it's, it's just uh, it's just kind of something that happened that's been kind of fun. And when I got asked to share experience and experience yeah. about something in numismatics, that kind of just popped in mind. 
No, absolutely. I well, um, thank you again, uh, Dr. Hans Lu, and this was wonderful and educational. So thank you. I hope everyone enjoyed it and, and learned as much as I did. Again, um, we want to thank Grace Sheet for their partnership with the ANA e Learning Academy, and we hope you guys will join us for future webinars. So. Uh, yeah, at this point, everyone have a great day and thank you for attending.